Hey, future respiratory therapist. So I have another video here for you and I want to be completely honest with you. I've received a ton of requests. Okay. I have a list super long that I'm working on very diligently, but I do want to give you a little bit of insight into what I've been dealing with in my personal life. My wife's um, grandmother just recently passed away. She was on mechanical ventilation for 10 days prior to that, be before her passing. Uh, life support was withdrawn and she passed later that day. She's in a much better spot. I'm not looking for sympathy. I don't need any words or sorry for your losses or anything. If you want to send them, that's fine. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I appreciate your patience because I've been receiving lots of requests and I'm getting to them but I've just been a little preoccupied with all of this process, okay? Now, having said that, I'm starting back up with answering a question for a follower of mine for a very long time. This, this channel is about nine months in the making, okay? And from day one, this student, I believe in Florida, her name is Marilyn, she has been on the channel and on the Instagram, and she's been constantly involved, asking questions, and being a part of this whole process. And <clears throat> it's time for me to answer her question. Her question is, is talk to us about hemodynamics, okay? And so I'm going to do that today, and I want to give a special thanks to Marilyn for being very, very patient. I know this is a long time in the making, but here it is. And soon to follow will be the answers to the rest of your questions, okay? So without any further ado, let's just get into talking about hemodynamics. Now, when you talk about hemodynamics, you need to understand you're talking about some deep stuff, okay? You're talking about, you're, you're talking about stuff that, that most respiratory therapy students struggle to grasp, okay? And so I'm going to try to break it down for you into the easiest way that I can, okay? And hopefully make it make sense and help you along your way, along your journey and in your exam so that you perform better for your instructors that you're with right now, okay? Now, to understand hemodynamics, the first thing you need to understand is blood flow through the heart. So let's just jump into it, okay? <clears throat> we know that blood flow to the heart returns back to the right side of the heart via the inferior and superior vena cava. And they dump into the right atrium. This is known as central venous pressure, CVP. Normal is two to six millimeters per mercury, okay? When you're studying hemodynamics, the most important part is understanding and knowing your normal values. That's the most important part. If you don't know your normal values, then you have no idea what you're looking at. Okay, so you have to know your normal value. CVP, normal, two to six millimeters per mercury. Okay, from the right side of the heart, the blood flow travels through the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery pressure is 10 to 20 millimeters per mercury. That's mean pulmonary artery pressure, 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. From there, we go into the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, where we're looking at normal values of 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, I'm going to stop right here because I want to point something out, okay? Your CVP should be in the low single digits, okay? Your pulmonary artery pressure should be in the low double digits, the teens, okay? The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure should be in the low single digits, but on the high side of the single digits, five to 10. If you could remember that, we start with a low pressure here. You have a, a, a higher pressure in the pulmonary artery pressure, mean, mean pulmonary artery pressure. And then the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure returns to a slightly higher, but single digit pressure. However you have to remember it, you have got to know these numbers, okay? Because if you don't, then you have no idea how to interpret the numbers we're about to get into. And then when you get into the left side of the heart, via the pulmonary vein, you get to the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart, mean arterial blood pressure, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Or if the 
you're talking in terms of cardiac output, you're talking four to eight liters per minute. I know these numbers are hard to see for you, but it's the best I can do right now, okay? So know those numbers. Two to six on the right side of the heart, 10 to 20 in the pulmonary artery, five to 10 in the pulmonary capillaries, and 80 to 100 in the left side of the heart, associated with four to eight liters per minute of cardiac output. Okay, you got to know blood flow through the heart, period. Okay, now let's take it a step back. The right side of the heart, we have the tricuspid valve right here. We have the pulmonic valve right here. We have the mitral valve right here. And then we have the aortic valve as this goes out to systemic circulation. Okay. So you also have to understand your valves because they also can become stenotic and cause pressure differences, okay? So make sure you understand every component of your blood flow through your heart starting at the right atrium, okay? That's the first words of advice that I have for you to answer this question. Now, when it gets into deciphering hemodynamics, so this is increased, this is increased, this is decreased. How do I know what the problem is? That gets a little more complicated, but here's the way I want you to think about it. Think about blood flow through the heart as a highway, okay? Like a highway you drive on, okay? So I've done the same thing here, but I've done it here. CVP, pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, blood pressure, cardiac output, okay, from the left side of the heart. So this is the right side, this is the left side. This is your pulmonary artery pressure, this is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, okay? And think about it like a highway. So, let's just talk for a second non-respiratory. You're driving down the highway, and suddenly you come to a stop and you're late for an appointment. And you now realize that your pressure inside of you, the pressure inside of you is rising. And you're like, man, I'm gonna be late. I'm pissed off. Ugh, like this is no fun. You're sitting in traffic on a highway. You realize and you know deep down inside that there's a point in the highway that there's a problem. Everything behind that problem causes high pressure because everybody behind the problem has somewhere to be. So their pressure is high. They're pissed. Like, yeah, I'm ready to get where I'm trying to get. But once you get past the problem, the pressure and the tenseness goes way down. Oh, sweet. Now I'm driving easily. I can get there. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. So that's how you have to approach hemodynamics, is understanding that wherever the problem is, pressures behind the problem are going to be high. Pressures after the problem are going to be low. And that's hemodynamics. Okay? So let's give you a few examples. Okay? We're going to start with CHF. Everybody who's watching this video, I hope, if you're a first-year student, watching this video, you should turn it off right now because while it may help you, it's probably not going to help you because you're not to this point yet of understanding. So this is going to get you excited about something and, and confuse you and you're going to go back and ask your, your, your professor about something and they're going to go, why are you even asking me about this? Because we're not even there yet. You're a first semester student. So, which is fine. Every student has its role. Play your role. If you're a first semester student watching this video, keep watching. I would love for you to get ahead of the game. But my second semester or my, my second year students watching this video, these things should make sense to you. When we talk about congestive heart failure, you're talking about left-sided heart failure. The left ventricle is tired of constantly pushing all of this fluid out throughout the body. And what happens to this pressure? It goes down. 
And because the left ventricle can no longer keep up with the demands of all the fluid coming in, everything behind it goes up. Now, so we have increased CVP, increased PAP, increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, decreased cardiac output, decreased blood pressure. What's the problem? Well, the problem is happening right here because this is the oddball, right? This is the one that's down. So if that's the one that's down, then the problem has to be happening on the left side of the heart, which tells you you're dealing with congestive heart failure. The fluid backs up into the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The fluid backs up into the pulmonary artery, which causes that pressure to go up. And the fluid backs up into the right side of the heart, which causes that pressure to go up. Okay? So when you see CVP, PAP, and PCWP all up with a decreased cardiac output or a decreased systemic blood pressure, you need to ask yourself, is this a CHF patient? Is this, is this a CHF patient? And the answer is probably yes, okay? So <clears throat> that's that in regards to CHF. Now, there's a couple of other things here. Because remember, you have right here the mitral valve. You also have right here the aortic valve. If any of those become stenotic, then guess what? The problem is on the left side of the heart. The pressure falls here. Pressures increase back from it. Okay? So you need to be aware of that. Okay? Now, I'm going to erase this because I'm going to put up different scenarios here. So we're going to take these away. And now we're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension. This is in times of acidosis or acidemia or in times of hypoxemia or chronic hypoxemia. The problem now is going to result in pulmonary vasoconstriction. That's going to increase your PVR, your pulmonary vascular resistance. So the problem now is here. So if the problem is here and you have an increase in PVR, then your pulmonary artery pressure goes up. And if your pulmonary artery pressure goes up, then your CVP goes up. What happens beyond the problem? It goes down. Okay? So if you have an increased pulmonary artery pressure and an increased CVP, but your cardiac output is down, then you're talking increased pulmonary vascular resistance, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary vasoconstriction associated with acidemia or hypoxemia. Okay, so you need to be able to recognize that. Okay, now I'm just highlighting a few of the most common. Okay, but we're going to do it and, and just go with it where it is. Okay, now let's say that you have a patient that presents with a massive pulmonary embolism, like a saddle pulmonary embolism. Okay, a saddle pulmonary embolism happens when there's a clot that happens at the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. Okay, so the problem is now here. So the problem is here. What's going to happen behind the problem? Pressures are going to go up. What happens after the problem? After you get past the massive car wreck, pressures go down. Okay, why? Because there's a blockage here, which means there's increased pressure here, yet there's decreased pressures here. So this is what a pulmonary embolism would look like. It would cause you to have an increased CVP while your PCWP and your blood pressure or your cardiac output go down. That would be pulmonary embolism. Okay. Now there's variations with the pulmonary embolism because they can happen in other places other than the pulmonary artery. They can happen in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. So with the pulmonary embolism, just know that you can have you know, variations from this, okay? You can actually have a normal PCWP and still have a pulmonary embolism. But for the most part, if you're being straightforward in your examination and your understanding, 
then this is what would happen with a pulmonary embolism. Okay. Now, while we're talking here, we have a problem happening right here. You need to understand that with CVP being up, you also need to remember that you have the tricuspid valve here and you have the pulmonic valve here. Okay, so let's say you have a reduction. Let's say you have tricuspid valve stenosis or pulmonic valve stenosis. Then guess what you're going to have? If the problems are here, which means they're happening here or here, then you're going to have decreased pulmonary artery pressure, decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, and decreased bl pulmonary blood flow. Why? And I'm sorry, systemic blood flow being cardiac output or mean systemic pressure. Why? Because the problem is happening at these spots here, which is going to back fluid up, increase your CVP, but decrease everything else. Make sense? If it doesn't, leave me comments below. I want to hear your thoughts on this because, like I said, this is complicated. And I know that my, my 16 to 20 minutes of a video is not going to clarify all questions. So leave them below. I'll be glad to answer them. Now, we need to talk about one more, two more different scenarios. If all of your numbers are down, CVP, pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and your systemic blood pressure are all down, then you're probably looking at hypovolemia, which means you don't have enough fluid in your circulatory system. And so your whole pressure goes down, just like in your car. If you lose fluid in your car, a closed system pump, your pressure will go down, okay? And the exact opposite is true when all of these are up. If every single one of these numbers are up, then your problem is hypervolemia. Okay? It hasn't led to CHF yet. Your, your left ventricle is still working effectively in a, actually a hypertensive state. And that's because it's effectively circulating blood, circulating fluid. Okay? And, but you have too much. So the whole pressure in the entire system is increased across the board. Okay? And that will give you increased values everywhere. Okay? So if everything is down, you've lost fluid and you're hypovolemic. But if everything is up, then you're hypervolemic. Okay? When you start seeing changes like this is low, but this is high, then you have to find where the problem is. Everything behind that point will be high, everything after that point will be low, and you should be able to figure out the answer. Marilyn, if this doesn't answer your question, please hit me up again, and I know you will. For everybody else, if you need further clarification or have specific questions, please hit me up. Hit the subscribe button, watch my other videos, give me some comments, I love answering questions. Hope all of you are having fun learning how to become respiratory therapists. Best wishes.